If a parasitic superorganism started infecting people and animals all around you, turning them into zombie porcupines that attack anything that gives off heat, what would you do? In this how to be video, we'll follow two couples, one on their anniversary camping trip and the other a convict with his drug addict girlfriend running from the law. See if we can make better decisions and ultimately attempt to beat the spiky parasite in Splinter. If you think you could do better, leave a comment letting me know how. If you enjoy watching me dissect the actions of average people dropped in nightmare situations, go ahead and hit those like and subscribe buttons. Let's talk about a real horror situation. You're in your kitchen prepping dinner when you realize your cheapo knives are now slipping, making a mess of ingredients and barely able to cut through meat. You also realize that if an intruder were to burst through your front door, the dull cutlery in your hand won't save you. Stay ready for anything the kitchen or life throws at you with this video's sponsor, Kamikoto. Kamikoto makes flawless kitchen knives out of Japanese steel using traditional Japanese techniques. Kamikoto those expert bladesmiths take each knife through a rigorous, several-year, 19-step process before it's finished. Handcrafted and sharpened using traditional techniques passed down through generations of knife smiths. Kamikoto stands behind each knife with a lifetime guarantee in their first-rate customer service. They offer all types of Japanese steel knives, such as the Sentoku, Chukabocho, Nokogiraha, Yanagiba, Nakiri, and Roba. You can maintain the edge of these blades with Kamikoto's Toishi Sharpening Whetstone. Each knife comes in a beautiful, heavy-duty ash wood box, which not only stores them safely, but also makes Kamikoto a great gift. The knives truly are beautiful. I almost feel like John Wick being presented with dessert by the Kamikoto master knifesmith himself. I've used the knives on everything but home intruders, and they slice effortlessly. I'm no chef, but Kamikoto knives are used by several chefs working at Michelin star restaurants. If you buy now, Kamikoto is offering viewers an extra 50 US dollars off any product by using the discount code NERD50. Go to Kamikoto Kamikoto.com slash nerd, click the link in the top right corner or the link in the description box below. We start out following a gas station attendant in the slow part of town who isn't aware he's in the prologue of a horror movie, and his gruesome death is about to set the tone for the main character's journey, which is why when he hears some movement in the grass behind him, he casually goes to check it out while popping potato chips in his mouth. <laughs> To be honest, this dude had no chance. He was just a simple man doing a simple job, no real threats to worry about, then BAM! Some rabid animal screeches out of the bushes and bites him. We as humans are lucky that more tiny animals don't fuck with us. Just think, if all squirrels suddenly decided they fancied the taste of human eyeballs, this world would be a very scary place. They breed like crazy, they can hide in every tree and building, and they're quick as hell. A few of them scurrying up your pant leg and jumping on your head trying to claw your eyes out would be pretty hard to fend off. Not knowing about the backdrop of a disease rapidly spreading throughout the forest wildlife, a couple is out trying to have a romantic camping trip for their anniversary. They break their tent when trying to set it up, so they pack up and start heading for the local motel instead. On the way, a scared, sickly-looking woman steps out of the tree line, waving them down. This is where the Choose Your Path adventure begins. Option A, stop the car and see if she needs help. Option B, push the gas pedal down and forget you ever saw her. Being a paranoid person who assumes the worst of people, I'd go with option B. She doesn't look hurt or look like she's the type to camp alone. She's also not panicking or running from something. Her story just isn't adding up. Couple that with a road that's far from help, rarely traveled, and is perfectly set up for an ambush from both sides. This smells like a trap to me. Oh my god, it's Polly needs to punch it now and keep her head down enough to not catch a round in the base of her skull while up enough to not drive them both into the tree that they'd be summarily executed behind. Most people have trash aim and a six shooter anxiously fired into the back of a vehicle accelerating away from them will probably miss all their rounds. Most people, even degenerate convicts like this guy, don't actually want to blow your head off. If you call their bluff, they might give up and wait for another passing car that's driven by somebody less courageous. You might think that this is a risky play, but I don't think so. If this convict was in fact a trigger-happy sociopath that opened fire, your odds of survival doing a quarter-mile pull away from him are vastly better than being held hostage and trying to carry out his frantic orders with a 357 Magnum in your face. Polly and Seth hesitate too long and give in to his demands. The attacker, Dennis, is on his game, totally in control of the situation. He orders everyone into the correct positions where Polly and Seth are separated and he can see everything that's going on, and then scraps everyone's phone so they can't go style 911. It shouldn't be more than a couple hours drive to the Mexican border, if nothing out of the ordinary happens. What the shit is that? 
Dennis hands his pistol to his drug addict girlfriend and has himself and Polly work on changing the tire while Lacey and Seth investigate what they hit. Handing his pistol to Lacey was dumb. She probably doesn't know how to use it and Seth might be able to overpower her if she gets distracted. Meanwhile, Polly contemplates using the tire iron on Dennis, but stops herself when she realizes that this guy has probably been in a lot more fights than her and it's unlikely to go her way. Not to mention that she just removed her car's tire and her boyfriend is currently being held at gunpoint 30 yards away. Even if she knocked him out, it's not like they could just hop in and drive away. Dennis wheels the spare out, and instead of having Polly take out the flat, he trades places with her. This little unnecessary move cost him his life. When he pulls the flat out, he gets poked by the same dead animal splinter that punctured the tire. Lacey is batshit crazy, demanding that Seth, a biology student, revive the dead animal, which he thinks was her pet. Seth plays along to not get shot. I'd do the same. Yeah, that's not right. There's no way this animal survived and was lucid enough to attack him. There's no time to ponder what he just saw with Lacey and Dennis swinging a pistol around. Whatever they hit somehow managed to cause a radiator leak. The car sputters along far enough to reach the next gas station. It appears to be a strike of good luck, but this is the same gas station the attendant was ravaged at. Lacey finds him in the bathroom, suffering his final moments before the parasite takes control. Naturally, Lacey runs back to the group, yelling about a near-dead man in the bathroom. What spells her demise is that she didn't realize that it got up and came after her. Let's get back! Lacey! Lacey didn't stand a chance. There was no way she could have gotten away from the thing in time. Dennis fires a couple bullets into it to no effect. It just contorts itself some more and chases after Seth. They all rush inside the gas station and lock up. I wouldn't place too much confidence in that glass. Searching for a way out the back is the next priority, as well as using the phone to call for help. Or not. God damn it, dude. There's a fucking bulletproof man porcupine zombie outside that just massacred your girlfriend, and you're worried about some small town cops. When Dennis tries to rip out the CCTV system next, he sees Lacey moving her arm. Thinking she's alive and needs help, he sneaks outside to drag her back into the gas station. It goes without saying that this is a terrible idea. Lacey looks dead as fuck and her arm is making weird movements, almost the same motions that the attendant was making. It's good news for Seth and Polly, though. They can rid themselves of a psycho that will constantly sabotage any attempt to get help. Whether or not he reloaded his six-shooter, they need to lock him out. If he brings the obviously parasite-infested Lacey into the gas station with them, they're as good as dead. But just in case he does have ammo left, Polly and Seth need to grab supplies and head out the back door before he gets back. Between the spiky boy on the hood of their car, Dennis with his gun, the radio leaking and Lacey turning into a spiky girl, driving out of here isn't an option anymore. They're gonna need to run down the road until they find help. Seth and Polly stupidly wait until Dennis returns and points his gun at their heads, forcing them to open up anyways. At least he didn't drag Lacey's entire body into the gas station. Still, this hand should be treated with extreme caution, since it's highly infectious and can scurry around on its own like a spider. Apparently, Seth's PhD program didn't cover basic safety or general common sense. The silver lining of his stupidity is that he's able to correctly assess that this thing is a parasitic superorganism, like a slime mold. What I'm surmising is that it's able to either use chemical sensing in the case of the hand, or take over a host's sensing faculties, like the attendant's eyes, ears, and brain in order to seek prey and spread itself. Basically, the hand can only sniff them out, whereas the attendant and Lacey can hunt them like a zombie would. Okay, time to go out the back door and run away as far as possible, only it's locked and Seth can't find the keys. Dennis suggests using a screwdriver to pop the hinges, which is a good call. Those comic skills do come in handy in the Scourge. They pop the door off, only to find a secondary locked gate. Dennis, with his convict skills, might be able to pick the lock with a paper clip and a makeshift tension wrench from something in the store. This option, of course, is completely ruined when Polly yells in frustration, alerting Lacey Thing to their plans. Dennis reinstalls the door, and they head back to the front where a cop is waiting for them outside. They try to plead for her to get back inside her car and call it in. She does call it in, or at least tries with no answer, but she stubbornly doesn't want to let Dennis out of her sight. Well, 
well, running is out of the question, not with these thorny zombies parkouring around like ninjas. Fighting is also completely out. Dennis is out of ammo, not that bullets were that effective. There's no less than three of them out there now, and if they catch one little splinter, it's all over. Judging from the lack of response to the cops 514, this is not an isolated incident. Also, I'm not sure why she used the code 514. I'm pretty sure that means she's on a stakeout and uniformed officers need to stay away, which is the opposite of calling for help. Even though running is near suicide, if one of the things makes it inside, they should run for the cop car. Cops always leave their cars running. The doors may or may not be locked, so they should bring a pointed object that they can use to punch the driver window out. Polly and Dennis's plan is to leak lighter fluid out the back door into the tree line to set the forest ablaze which surrounding fire departments would see. I don't think this will work. Lighter fluids evaporate way too quickly and the vegetation is too wet for a meaningful fire to start. Also, setting fire to a gas station seems dangerous. Seth has a better idea. Rig a couple clothes hangers together and snake it underneath the door to pull the cop's radio over to them. Then they can actually call for backup with it. Considering this is a growing parasite and not a virus, it might theoretically be possible for Dennis to amputate his hand and save himself. This is a gas station without any tools, and Seth isn't a surgeon, but he's damned if he doesn't try. The only other option is to get out of here into a hospital where it can be professionally amputated in time. Not wanting Polly and Seth to turn on him, Dennis continues to hide his severely infected ticking time bomb of a hand from them. Seth hooks the radio and nearly pulls it under the ticket counter, but their plan does not go unnoticed by the splinter-infected host. Lacey Think caused the microphone to get ripped out and then assimilated the cop's legs which held the actual radio. Now they have no way to call for help besides attempting to start a large fire somehow. That's going to be a problem with Lacey's hand crawling into the gas station. <laughs> Dennis yells for them to crawl through the freezer door into the back room. Another solid move. They should all have been assessing exits and escape routes in the event of a break-in, before a break-in happens. You don't want to be trying to find a fallback location when you're in full sh your pants mode. Dennis's infection is spread enough that hiding it is impossible. The parasite is starting to take control of his arm, weaponizing it to further infect its host and those around him. Don't let him touch you. Don't touch it! Get away! Now Dennis wants to get a knife to amputate his arm to stop the spread before it infects his torso. Yeah dude, that was the obvious course of action when your finger was turning black and your girlfriend mutated into a human porcupine. It's a little late now. Seth and Polly are taking on massive risk by trying to help you sever your arm off when you or your independently sentient arm could start swinging at them at any moment. Then again, Dennis is occupying their Alamo, even if they wanted to leave. There's nowhere safer to go. Oh god damn, all they have is a fucking box cut. Dennis passes out from the pain and infection before he can even start. I'm debating whether Polly and Seth should shove his ass back out the freezer door. As dangerous as holding him down and performing the surgery themselves is, I still think it's less dangerous than having a full-bodied splinter-infected host roaming the gas station aisles next to them. Seth and Polly no longer hesitate and do what must be done. After cracking open some brewskis in celebration of a successful surgery, Seth has an epiphany. When he was first attacked by the attendant, the attendant thing hopped onto the hood of his car instead of chasing him. This leads him to think that the parasite is attracted to sources of heat. That's also why the hand thing stopped tracking them when they were in the fridge. Seth thinks that if he can lay on ice and cool his body down to less than the ambient temperature, he should be invisible and can walk over to the cop car like a ghost. I think they need to do a bit more testing to be sure. While I agree that that is how the hand thing seems to be tracking them, his theory heavily discounts the full-bodied hosts potentially being able to see him using their eyes. One such test would be to throw a fresh cold turkey out the front door and see if they attack it. It's clearly food, so if they ignore it, Seth should be good to go. If they're just gonna assume his hypotenuse is correct and send him out there after laying on ice, they should at least light a fire in the back to double his supposed cover. Polly has a box of firecrackers she's going to use for the diversion instead. This, I think, is a mistake. Seth is gonna be deep into hypothermia. His body and legs will be so cold that the gross motor function of walking to the car will be very slow, and the fine motor function of getting into the car and driving it to them will be extremely difficult. They need a more constant source of heat that will last long enough for him to accomplish his task. 
plan seems to be working, but sure enough, he's moving painstakingly slow. Their firecrackers barely keep the monsters busy long enough for him to make it into the cop car. Problem is, the keys aren't in the ignition, and his body temp is rising fast. Dennis runs outside to throw another fountain near the monster to provide a diversion. The cheap five-year-old piece of shit putzes out, and he becomes the bait. Seth, realizing it's time for plan B, unracks the shoddy and starts pumping the three-person splinter thing full of buckshot. It's surprisingly useless. You'd think that a handful of shotgun rounds would blow enough holes in it that its motor function would at least be impaired temporarily. The fire erupting in the back from their lighter fluid and fireworks saves Seth's ass. The little hand thing that was about to crawl up his pants was stupid enough that its base instincts caused it to fling into the raging flames. The biggin isn't so dumb. Dennis realizes that the only way Polly and Seth make it out of here alive is if he sacrifices himself. Seth tosses him the pump, and Dennis Sarah Connors the splinter thing. Again, the shotgun has no real stopping power against it. He gets tackled and sliced up in places he can't amputate, but escapes its clutches long enough to reload and fire one into the diesel pump it's standing next to. Fire is always the preferred method for parasite infestations. In Dennis's last words, he asks them to make sure his nest egg makes it to the wife of the man he killed some years ago. He tells them to get out of here, that he's gonna finish himself off. Seth and Polly really need to ensure that the splinter parasite that they know of was fully destroyed. If Dennis just pops his head off, the splinter thing might still be able to detach a limb from his body and exponentially infect other wildlife. And the gas station attendant on the hood of their car is still technically alive. Yeah, that should do it. I don't blame Seth and Polly for not wanting to go back and ensure the Splinter's destruction by fully burning the corpses. I mean, f*** that. But it's still dangerous to neglect. Sure, they could walk to the next town over and report the nightmare incident. Except the cops won't believe them until they walk in with their guard down and any surviving Splinter thing attacks them. Then again, it's highly likely that this wasn't an isolated incident. The animal on the road could easily have infected other animals, which are attacking and assimilating all the nearby wildlife in towns. My I personally think that they should have waited until the fire subsided, then grabbed the cop's car keys out of the ashes and driven to the next town. Walking along the road next to a forest potentially full of infected animals into a town potentially full of infected people seems like a terrible idea. The movie ends with an infected animal growing splinters out of its face, continuing the unstoppable spread of the parasite across the world. Let's recap the pivotal points where different decisions could have altered who lived and died. The gas station attendant had no chance. Given how widespread the splinter parasite is by now, it's hard to say that Polly and Seth would have been better off having not stopped for Lacey and gotten hijacked. They could just have easily been mauled in their shitty motel late that night. Knowing that the splinter thing seeks heat, it was crazy and lucky that their car got totaled by running over a splinter-infected possum. Lacey had no chance when she got attacked by the attendant thing. The cop also had no chance. She had no way of knowing the danger she was in. Nothing they did or could have done differently at the gas station will ultimately matter. The splinter parasite is everywhere by now. If they drove to another town, if it's not in ruins already, nobody will believe them until it's too late. It's almost impossible to kill or stop its spread, which means it's just a matter of time until splinter squirrels swarm you. All said and done, I think the parasite from splinter is unbeaten. Thanks for watching, and remember, don't stop your car for innocent looking women on the side of remote forest roads. Thank you